a lot of men and women who have great hordes of admirers do often, I mean, Ben, you suspected that perhaps some of the same words that he had written to you, he might have written to others, and I, I dare say that's true, but, but I also think he was pretty specific about the people. At the same time, he was aware of his role as an encourager and, a, and I hate, don't like the word mentor, teacher, to many, many people. But I think, I mean, maybe it was his special gift to make his followers feel specific. No, I think you're right. I think he didn't say, he said almost exclusively kind things, but sometimes he said something that was true and more true than kind, and I think the things he said were specific to me. Yeah. Uh, you're right. I was, I was, my need for to put myself down was causing me to besmirch the picture. But there was yeah. something about his attention that was very extraordinary, and I, I don't know if you felt this, but I always, after spending an afternoon with him, especially when he was really very old, you felt somehow that you weren't quite worthy of this attention. Yeah. <laughs> that he had given you this tremendous yes. attention, especially curious about your childhood. Because when Bill was interested in someone, he really wanted to know about the person's childhood. And then, because childhood was so important to him and his, I mean, there was such a clear before and after in his own life where his childhood had been sundered and he, yeah. he felt he lost it when he was 10 years old. But he did, when he liked someone, he was very, he'd try and get you to talk about your childhood. And so, I don't know, you'd always leave there and you'd feel somehow loved in excess of your worth. And elevated. And elevated. I wish you'd talk because you're the yes. person who came to him through his prose. And the trouble with this wonderful conversation we're having is we're kind of feeding the idea that what really matters in life is individuals when we all really believe that what matters is, is words on a page. So what was it about his writing? What, what piece of writing was it that made you think this is, you know, this is the real thing, this well, is not. I don't think you can separate the, the writer from the words on the page. I mean, people say Oh, I that, think you can. Well, well you can say that, that there <laughs> are some horrible people who have written wonderful works, mm -hmm. but that's certainly not the case with William Maxwell, no. or with a lot of the other writers who I admire greatly. And uh, he loved to quote that uh, quote by Saul Bellow, uh, a writer is simply a reader moved to emulation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's absolutely true in my case from reading So Long, See You Tomorrow, uh, which I, I consider, as, as Chris says, almost perfection there. Um, and some people think of William Maxwell as sort of the most sort of old-fashioned and kind and compassionate of writers, and yet that book is this, this odd postmodern quilt in which the people do terrible things to each other. They do terrible things terrible, in his books. Terrible, terrible things. I, he would, he would, I remember that he, I'd read the folded leaf, and he he was you know mentioned a scene from it to me, and I I, I thought well I never realized how awful that was because the, because the music of the language was such and the whole elevation was such that you didn't realize that people were just doing the most ghastly things. And he has a very light touch, and he doesn't need to push it. It's yeah. there. He sets it out yeah. in front of you, and you can read it for yourself and understand it for yourself there. They get disfigured. They get, I mean, awful things. Oh, horrible things. things. But, but you said uh, more true than kind. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. absolutely true of yeah. his work. And yet there is also a compassion that we would put up there with someone like Chekhov, I think, um, or a Tolstoy there. there there's... there's there's not a coldness there. There is, as, as well as empathy, there is sympathy, I think, for almost all the, almost all, not all, but almost all the characters. And I find that especially touching in So Long, See You Tomorrow, in that the character that he blames the most or who, who wrongs others the most in his eyes is himself, or the first person narrator. It's almost a confession of, a lack of human feeling. And, and at the same time, he goes back to this past and salvages and saves this precious part of the past that is lost to everyone. And yet it's an apology. I think I found that absolutely moving and decided that I needed to do something like that, looking back at my past, being at that age, I was about 30 when I came to him. I'm, I'm not a literary person, at least I wasn't then. Uh, I was an engineer, and I'd simply come across this book at a used book sale at a library that had withdrawn it and gotten rid of it. And I wanted to sort of save the book. Um, 
And I think it's natural for someone in, say, their late 20s, early 30s to look back at the past and try to make sense of it there. I mean, a lot of you know, the, the writers that he worked with were famous for that. Salinger, obviously, Updike and Pigeon Feathers, Larry Wywoody and you know, Beyond the Bedroom Wall. And so I went back purposely to look at my life and the things that had gone on that I didn't quite understand and, and perform that sort of mea culpa on a larger scale. Uh, and that, that changed everything for me. Did you, did, forgive me for not knowing, did you know him? Did you go to meet him? No, no, I had never met him. Um, after I had read his work and gone back and, and, and looked at it, I wrote him a letter to say how much it meant to me and uh, what an inspiration he had been for my writing. And he very kindly wrote me back. Uh, I didn't expect him to do that. And, and once he had, I didn't pursue it. I thought, you know, I don't want to bother him anymore. Right. There. But I came to him in the, the mid-'80s um, from So Long, See You Tomorrow, published in 1980. I had no idea of this gigantic backstory or the fact that he was the New Yorker fiction editor for you know, 35, 40 years, or the other books that he'd written. I had to really go back into the reprints from the David Godin and search those out and find them again because I had no idea who this person was. So he didn't come to me sort of this as this gray eminence. Um, it was this sort of exciting new writer that I had found, <laughs> William Maxwell, you know, who knew? Well, I hope that, that now that he's in the Library of America, that many more readers will come to him that way and complete, save you all that trouble. <laughs> well, now it, it's great because whenever I go out on a, a reading tour, I always recommend So Long, See Tomorrow, and I just push it on everyone that I can find. And I, I always say to them, it's 135 pages long, and there's a lot of white space on those pages. <laughs> you could read this book instead of watching that crappy movie on Stars tonight, you know. Um, 